I certainly hope that all of us, day by day, keep before us the sentiments of that song. For such will help us in being determined to live as the Bible teaches, will remind us that what is here in the flesh and the material things will pass away. And all that is taught in the scriptures about heaven will be a reality, and that for eternity. Many, many years ago, as a young preacher while speaking and working with the church in Van Buren, Arkansas, remembering, if you don't know the topography of the place, that it's separated from Fort Smith by the Arkansas River, I came to know a preacher a little older than me, not a lot, who was the preacher for the black congregation, one of them that was there, and we, we got to be pretty good friends. And in the process of things, I asked the elders there if they would have him in a meeting. They were trying to find somebody at that time, and so he came and preached. And in the process of preaching, he began to deal with 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9, where Paul is writing to the church at Corinth concerning the membership and the kind of people they had been before the gospel came to them, before they obeyed it. And when he was talking about becoming a Christian, he read verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, and revilers, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And in the process of quoting that scripture, he made it very clear that whatever your state of affairs, if you're baptized, then you're all right. And he went ahead and elaborated on it for a while. And it became obvious that whatever spouse you're with, no matter how many times you've been baptized, or rather divorced and remarried before the spouse you're with, and whatever reason that happened, then when you're baptized, you can stay with the one you're with. Well, I understood him pretty well. And so I uh, talked with the elders, and uh, after he finished that sermon, they had picked up on it too, and we asked to visit with him in the library. And sure enough, that's exactly what he believed. It doesn't make any difference how many times that you're divorced or remarried <clears throat> before you become a Christian. And for whatever reason there might have been that when you hear the gospel, then when you're baptized, then that takes care of everything. Well, I want to talk about that for a little while because it still exists. Because we live in a world, as I don't have to remind you, but for sake of emphasis, to where people just don't respect the authority of God in general or the Bible as to where God reveals that authority. And certainly the respect for what the Bible teaches concerning the sanctity of marriage. It is violently opposed sometimes. Maybe I should say militantly opposed. It's disregarded by people of all economic, social, racial, geographical, and religious backgrounds. And over the last uh, about 50 years, it's really caused lots of problems in the church. And, of course, that happened because the morals of this country are just going down further and further. And for a long time, what the Bible taught about marriage and divorce-free marriage, the public, at least in the South in general, upheld. But all of that has changed in my lifetime and less than my lifetime. Scripturally unjustified divorce and remarriage threatened the purity of almost every congregation of the Lord's people in this country. I remember well, simply because I was one of his students, how well Brother Bales did in the opposing era at the time of the 60s and 70s, especially as a college teacher. 
And yet then he came out with a false doctrine saying that those outside of Christ are not amenable to the New Testament of Christ. You only become subject to it after you obey the gospel. Thus, he basically was teaching whoever you're married to, no matter how many times you've been married, for whatever reason you were divorced, then you can just stay in that position. Now, he would apply the truth of Matthew 19.9 to those who were members of the church, but he was simply saying, you're not amenable to the law of Christ unless you are a Christian to begin with. I remember Brother Deaver saying to him one time, he said, what good does it do, Brother Bales, to fight against all the denominational error that's coming into the church and then teach a doctrine that fills the church up with fornicators? Any error needs to be dealt with. Some errors are, are more quickly impacting the church than other errors. An error is that which is contrary to the truth of the New Testament. And thus, this was a problem we faced in those days. What I'm going to say is this. We must, underscore the word must, see divorce or remarriage from the divine viewpoint. Of course, that should be the approach we take to the Bible all the time. Because the only way you can know the divine viewpoint of anything is to read the Bible and understand it. We don't need non-Christian counselors and psychiatrists and sociologists of viewpoint, people who may be even atheists or infidels of some sort or certainly don't know the Bible. And churches have an obligation before God in remaining faithful and remaining pure not to violate any of God's laws, especially those I think of now since that's our subject on divorce or remarriage. People who refuse to repent. Yes, everybody in any sin can be saved. But you must be willing to submit to God's will and what it requires of you in order to be saved. Now, a particular disturbing view is the one I've just described. And that is that baptism, and if we're faithful, we emphasize baptism a great deal because the denominations don't believe that you have to be baptized to be saved from your sins. So, of course, we teach what the Bible teaches on baptism. But to carry that too far, baptism doesn't substitute for your compliance with the Lord's will as to assembling on the first day of the week and engaging in all the acts of worship or studying your Bible or prayer every day of the week or doing the things God expects Christians to do every day of the week. And baptism will not sanctify adulterous relationships so as to make them legitimate marriages before God. Regardless of one's past marital record, some say that would be divorced and remarried three times or whatever for reasons other than a spouse committing fornication then God sanctifies the status at baptism and allows him to continue his relationship with the present companion. Now that's why that uh, this young preacher cited 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 9. He was trying to say all of those people that he says uh, characterize some of the Corinthian members before they were Christians. But when they were baptized, it was all right. Now you're washed, verse 11. You're sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. Well, that's just not true. It's a false teaching and it jeopardizes both the doctrinal and moral purity of the Lord's church. Out of that sermon and our discussion, we had a debate in his church building. But I don't know that he ever changed. It was sort of a semi-public thing, more or less between those who were the elders over where I was preaching and a few there with him. But I'll tell you something about it as I go through this study. 
They begin by saying, well, doesn't baptism wash away or take away all sins? If you were to ask me that question, just ask that outright. Or if someone were to ask you that question, doesn't baptism take away all sin? My answer is no, it does not. Remember, baptism is a step, one step in the plan of salvation that must be preceded by other steps. And there's where the problem is. I wouldn't baptize somebody if they didn't believe in Jesus Christ. Belief plus baptism equals salvation. I wouldn't baptize somebody that would not confess Christ to be the Son of God. And I certainly wouldn't baptize somebody that was making it very clear I'm not going to repent of all of my sins. Thus, really, where a great amount of preaching needs to be done and understanding even among our own members is that though you may believe with all your heart Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God and the Savior of the world, that He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by Him. If you refuse to repent of all the sins in your life, then baptism is not going to do you any good whatsoever. We often say at the end of a sermon, or sometime during a sermon, that to be qualified to be baptized, you must first of all believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him. All of those steps are toward salvation. But you're only baptized into Christ. You don't believe into Christ. You don't repent into Christ. And you don't confess into Christ. But you're baptized into Christ. You're baptized in the Christ by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of forgiveness and watch it of past sins. Your alien sins, the sins that originally alienated you from God are all forgiven. God will hold them against you no more. But that baptism will not do that if, there, if it's not preceded by what the Bible describes and sets out for us as biblical faith repentance and confession. It seems that many people have failed to realize that and this was the failure of this young man I was talking about. So baptism will not forgive a sin known to an individual which is yet unrepented of. Faith in Jesus must precede baptism, Mark 16, 16. And baptism without prior faith is of no value. Repentance must also precede baptism. Acts 2.38, these were believers that heard this answer when they cried out, many brethren, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So baptism without prior repentance certainly is useless. Repentance demands that one sever all relationships which violate the will of God. Now, we don't have this as a problem yet. How long it will go before we do, I don't know. But in some parts of the world, it's been prevalent in their culture for years. Suppose that one's living in a polygamous relationship. And he has six wives. Well, I sometimes realize that, and I say, well, one thing I know, he doesn't have good sense, but be, be that as it may, does the gospel of Christ contain any teaching relative to that situation? He has six wives, he has five wives, he has ten wives, whatever. Is it the duty of the preacher of the gospel or the teacher of the Bible to impart the teaching of the Bible on marriage? before that person can be baptized scripturally. If the man makes it clear that he does not intend to repent of that sinful situation, question, can he scripturally be baptized? 
What if the situation involves a number of people living in a communal relationship and sharing sexual partners, as like the hippies of the 60s and so on? The question is, should we teach baptism to such persons without emphasizing repentance and what it means that they must engage in before they can be baptized? And will we not deal with that because of the, shall we put it in quotes, touchiness of the situation? Well, of course, the Bible's teaching about repentance must be taught to all people. They must be taught the whole truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just part of it. And then given the choice between obedience, complete obedience, and disobedience. That means that the adulterer must hear the same teaching as the polygamist or the libertine or the homosexual or the transsexual or anything like that that transgresses the will of heaven and they're living in it. The notion that baptism somehow sanctifies an unholy relationship so as to turn adultery into marriage, that is, Matthew 19, 6, God joined marriage, is preposterous. Baptism is not some sort of magic wand that you attended, uh, that you got because you graduated from Hogwarts University. And it performs marriage ceremonies for adulterers. It's amazing what people will not see that baptism does, that the Bible teaches, but they'll try to see everything in the world in it that the Bible does not teach. What if only one of the two is baptized? Is the baptized person living in a, little, a legitimate state of marriage while his or her partner to the union remains adulterous. Such a view of baptism is completely unworthy of one who professes faith in a holy God. It comes from a lack of thinking or really maybe a lack of conversion itself on the part of folks who try to think this way. Now, it's also argued that there are some sins, such as murder, which simply cannot be undone. Well, while it's granted that a murderer cannot undo his act to the degree that he can bring back the one he murdered to life, this is not to say that he is without obligation to repent of the very deed that he did. I simply cite Saul of Tarsus who held the clothes of those that stoned Stephen. He was a party to the murder of Stephen. He had to repent of the spirit which produced the act of that murder. Hatred, whatever it was. He must manifest genuine remorse over having taken another's life without justification. And he must make restitution wherein he can make restitution according to the law. For example, let's say that a person murdered somebody years ago. Time goes by. He changes in his mind. Somewhere or another, he hears the gospel and understands it and wants to obey the gospel. But he must repent in order to be baptized scripturally. He believes in Christ. He has no problem confessing Christ. But he must repent. Yet he knows that he has this secret to where he actually murdered somebody. What's he going to do? He's going to have to meet whatever the law requires of him. Even if it means going to jail or suffering death, 
As Paul said one time, if I've done anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. Well, one thing about it, even if he had to undergo death, he would die a faithful child of God because he would have repented and made restitution as the law of the land required. It could involve, of course, a prison sentence. It might involve, if it was a man, a husband, a father, even paying restitution to the wife and children. There would be appropriate acts. But just how much do you believe in Christ? How much do you want to go to heaven? How much would a song like we just participated in mean to you when you understand the truth of God concerning the plan of salvation and hearing the gospel, believing it, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith, and being baptized? But his repentance in such a case, in some way, must be demonstrated. It must be. Murder, however, is not a complete or maybe even a true parallel to the situation involved in adultery. In a case of murder, there is a past fact of history. It cannot be altered. Well, in the case of adultery, one must not only be remorseful and sorry toward God for the sin he now knows he's committed and is living in. And he's established an adulterous relationship regardless of how the law of the land says he's all right. He must terminate the sinful conduct. Now, I would have no problem, as I did 40 some odd years ago, of saying that repentance demands the termination of ungodly conduct. What I did in my debate with him is I made a chart based on 1 Corinthians 6. And I took all of those people those sins that are listed in verse 9 and 10. And I put all under one column. Here's what some of those people were at the time the gospel came to them. And then I had another column and I said, why were they listed as fornicators, adulterers, adulterers, etc., thieves, coaches? It's because they did these things. Then I put baptism. So let's say here's a, a liar. Why is he a liar? He tells lies. Well, he's baptized. He continues to tell lies. There's no cessation of it. Now the last column, what is he? He's a wet liar. That's the only change <laughs> that there is. Now why is that the case? No repentance was followed. And I pressed him as hard as I knew how to press him on that one thing, and he couldn't get around it. He even got into the pulpit and said, Brother Brown, you sure shoot so hard. And I thought to myself, and I'm going to continue to shoot hard as long as you continue to hold a doctrine that denies repentance before baptism, which I did and pressed him. His best. I think I probably pressed him on that as much as I have anybody on the implications of their doctrines. If a person's a thief, he stole X amount of dollars. He learns the gospel. He wants to become a Christian. He believes in Christ. But he still has the stolen money. Now, if he repented, what's he going to do? He's going to have to make restitution. He's going to give up that money. And that's what I pointed out on my chart. This man's a thief. Why? Because he steals, takes that which does not belong to him. That's why he's a thief. Now, what has he got to do in order to be baptized scripturally? He's got to give up being a thief. Well, a man steals another man's wife. 
Granny, cooperation must be there. She must want to go with it. Well, can they stay in that which God does not sanction, does not authorize? It's not Matthew chapter 19, verse 6, marriage, where God joined them together. So the adulterer must give up his or her companion. And you know why? He or she never belonged to him as a wife or husband in the first place. God never joined them together. Some would quote Paul, as I mentioned earlier, as this young man did in 1 Corinthians 7.20. Let each man abide in that calling wherewith he was called. I heard that used in several different places by different ones, trying to say, well, uh, you don't break up a marriage. Well, it's not a scriptural marriage. It's not according to Matthew chapter 19 and verse 6. They have no right to be husband and wife. They're not authorized. They're not qualified to be husband and wife. So what's being said in the context of 1 Corinthians 7 is, is really as a slave or a free person. Or if, let's say, you're a seller of purple like Lydia. You don't have to give up those things to become a Christian. The idea is... Those things within themselves that are not in opposition to God and godly conduct do not have to be given up. But things that are sinful, no matter what, we turn away from them at repentance in the process of obeying the gospel of Christ. Now this would carry over to a member of the church who needs to repent of sins. They don't just come and make confession of fault and turn right around and walk back into the same sin that's the reason I said some weeks ago that the person who comes forward to make a public confession of fault has already repented. They just want the church to know they have and they're asking for the prayers of the church. Because private sins, not only do you and God, before you confess them to God or in the very process of confessing them, your heart has already said, I turn from it and will practice it no more. Or I'll begin to do whatever it is is a sin of omission I've, I've omitted. So this passage, 1 Corinthians 7, repented. So if I would say anything about what we face today, aside from all the other teaching that the world around about us doesn't know and rebels against in the denominational world or the secular world, our emphasis has got to be placed upon repentance because baptism will not take away one single solitary sin if that person has not repented of it. It will not do so. Baptism is not a marriage ceremony. It's not a divorce court. It doesn't take the place of worshiping God scripturally. It does only what God said it would do and that is determined on the basis of whether you genuinely believed and repented of your sins and confessed your faith in Christ. Then you're qualified to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ for the remission of your sins. And only then is that the case. And in a world like ours, if we cannot see that it is in a mess when it comes to long time practice sins and it's even going further then we need to know what people are doing what they're believing what is their background do you have an attitude as a teacher of the bible that you can't ask people questions that let you know where they are elders of the church and we tried to do that here for a long time long before i became an elder and that is, have questions to the people who want to place membership here. I'll tell you one of the first things that tells me a person is not what they ought to be when they do not want to answer questions. To answer questions, the right kind of questions, specifically and to the point, is to be found out. And when a person will not answer those questions, you've got probably the best answer you can get. This is really the genuineness of that person's character before God. All you have to do is look at Paul when he gets to Ephesus. 
and in trying to find out whether those men that are there have really obeyed the gospel or not. What did he do? He asked questions. Have you received the Holy Spirit since you were baptized? We've not so much as heard there be a Holy Spirit. Until, until what then were you baptized? You think he did that only one time? That's the only time ever Paul did that or any other faithful member of the church then or any other apostle did it? That tells us we need to ask some questions. And they need to be pointed to questions even more now than ever before in the state the world's in and especially the church. If you're not a child of God, we've made it very clear what it takes to become a child of God and the plan of salvation. Repentance is so important. Now, as a child of God, do you need to repent of sins? If so, we urge you to do so and come confessing them and praying God for forgiveness. And do so now while we stand and while we sing.